I see some uh, familiar faces from last month's presentation, so thank you very much for coming back. Can't hear? Okay, we'll fix that. Okay, we've gone up a little bit. How's that? Okay. So uh, my name is Denise Vigno. I'm from Development and Communications at Howard Center. And we're delighted to um, be offering this community education series uh, this fall. It's our first time. Uh, we had a presentation last month that was well attended. And then uh, tonight, uh, we have More Than the Blues. And then uh, next month on November 12th, you'll find some information in your packets about autism in children and teens. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you need to leave early or need help finding the restroom, we have ushers who are helping people make their way through this wonderful building that, in addition to what you saw, houses a tennis court, a ping pong um, tournament area, two cafes, and a rooftop garden. It's a gorgeous building. So we're so grateful uh, to be here, and we thank dealer.com for hosting us. Um, let's see. We also want to thank uh, VCAM, who uh, is in the room on the video, Tyler in the middle, and Wendy over on the left-hand side, your right-hand side of the room. Uh, we're going to have the uh, videos up within a couple of weeks on our Howard Center YouTube channel, and then also um, on our website. So, um, and then just lastly, thank you to United Way and all of our other partners. Many of you here have uh, spread the word, and so we're uh, so thankful for that. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Joe Lassick. And uh, Joe is the Associate Medical Director at Howard Center currently. Uh, he's been working with us for more than a decade, and he's also a clinical assistant professor at UVM, uh, for the Medical Center's Department of Psychiatry, and also an adjunct faculty for Southern New Hampshire University's graduate program in clinical mental health counseling. He's worked in many community locations, many mental health settings, corrections, and inpatient psychiatric settings uh, over the course of his career. So without further ado, we welcome uh, Joe. He's going to talk with us about more than the blues. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. How am I sounding up, up uh, in the back there? OK? Yeah, please let me know if I, I tend to uh, drift off as I speak. So let me know if I'm, I'm getting quiet. Uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, I have a lot to cover. Uh, and my general approach to presenting information is to put as much as I can in and then not get through it all in time. But I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to move pretty briskly tonight. I would ask that if you have questions that can wait till the end, uh, please do so. Please just jot those down, make a note, and we'll have time for discussion about half an hour, hopefully, at the end to talk uh, about what we're uh, presenting here tonight. Uh, if I'm totally incoherent or not making sense, please stop me, and I'll be happy to clarify that in a moment. But if it can wait, that would be helpful. So we're going to be talking about uh, depression today. I uh, hope to speak about you know, the kind of the spectrum of, of experience when it comes to depression, um, review remedies for depression, and I'm going to also uh, focus at the end about what to do if you or someone you love is feeling suicidal and, and kind of how to, how to evaluate that situation and what to do in the case of that situation. Because that's about the most important thing that we have to recognize and respond to in the case of someone who may, who may be really depressed. So depression has a large impact uh, on our society. Up to 25% uh, of Americans will experience depression in a year. Uh, about 15% will experience major depression, or sometimes called clinical depression, at some point in their lives. And that uh, increases in women up to 25% of women will sometime, at some point in their life experience depression. 5% of people have what's called chronic depression, depression that does not remit uh, two years or more. Um, having depressive symptoms without remission. 1% of people in our society to 3% roughly will suffer with bipolar disorder, which is a uh, fairly complex uh, set of experiences involving depressive episodes and then kind of the opposite of that, uh, manic episodes. Um, and this can be very complicated when it comes to treatment. 
It is the leading cause of disability in the United States at this point. It's the second leading cause of disability worldwide. And uh, it's pro projected to become the no number one cause of disability worldwide in the next 10 years. Um, it has a huge impact on functioning, on economic productivity. It has a huge impact on other medical conditions. People who are depressed don't tend to take the best care of their other medical issues. So it's well recognized that if somebody is having uh, med medical uh, issues like heart disease or uh, uh, cancer or uh, after a stroke, that treating depression aggressively is terribly important. Before I talk about all the you know, potential horrors of depression, and, and there are many for, for, for some people, I want to also step back and acknowledge that depression Sadness isn't always pathologic. Um, people can be sad sometimes, and it doesn't always mean we have to rush in and, and treat it like a medical emergency. Uh, in fact, you know, there, there's an evolutionary theory of depression uh, that milder forms of depression might actually be adaptive. Uh, they might actually reduce conflict in social situations. It may be a way for people to support, uh, elicit support from others. Um, and in case of, say, seasonal depression, which many of us at this point may be starting to experience at some level, uh, it helps us save energy for the winter when, you know, a few hundred years ago, there wasn't a lot of food to go around the winter, and therefore, you know, bringing things down for a few months at wintertime may have made adaptive sense. Um, some people also argue that depression can be a source of creativity. Many artists, great artists, um, have had problems with depression or issues with depression, and a lot of creativity has come out of that. Um, and uh, I'm partial to uh, Marshall Rosenberg and his theory, his uh, system of nonviolent communication. When he talks about emotions, sadness, um, uh, depression even, may be uh, a way for us to connect to deeper needs that we're not even realizing we're meeting. So um, I'm very partial to thinking of all emotions as being positive emotions that can give us more information about needs that might not be met for us. Typically in depression, those needs are connection, rest, meaning may not be met for a person. And if we can identify those, we can often correct uh, depression uh, at its earlier stages. So here's a pretty busy slide that kind of describes the, the spectrum of depressive experiences. Um, some of these I'll go into more detail in a bit. Uh, I will speak briefly here about situational depression, which is not a, a technically a clinical term that we usually use, but um, often colloquially we use this term when someone is having a you know, difficult time in their life, a stress, and they have depression symptoms, including maybe issues with appetite or sleep, um, but uh, it tends not to be very severe and it tends to recover spontaneously once the stressor has recovered. Uh, adjustment disorder is a clinical term. This is a little bit more significant type of depression where a stressor leads people to have higher levels of symptoms and more uh, difficulties with functioning. Uh, grieving is a special case, um, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Major depression uh, or clinical depression is often how it's referred, has many particular facets that I'll talk about. Uh, persistent depressive disorder, depression secondary to medical conditions or substances, and bipolar depression, again, are, are specific types of depression that I'll talk about in more detail. So kind of the emblematic or typical type of depression when we refer to uh, clinical depression or depression even without any modifier, we're usually referring to what, what in medicine um, and in, in psychotherapy uh, we call major depression either major depressive episode, if it's somebody's in an episode, or major depressive disorder, if uh, someone has more than one episode. And we define this kind of arbitrarily, but it works for the most part, um, as having at least two weeks with at least five of the following symptoms. And I've organized these symptoms according to the mnemonic device I learned in medical school, SIGI CAPS. Some of you may have heard of this before as a way to remember these symptoms. The first are sleep problems. In depression, you can have either what's typical is too little sleep, difficulty sleeping, restless sleep. A very classic symptom of what's called melancholic depression is early morning awakenings. People get up and they can't get back to sleep. Then we have what's uh, called atypical depression, classically described as including uh, wanting to sleep m more, uh, having uh, basically sleeping for most of the day, rarely getting out of bed. 
Uh, the I is interests, which are decreased in depression. The fancy term for this is anhedonia. Uh, it means having little pleasure in things, not getting pleasure out of activities you usually get pleasure from. Guilt, hopelessness, and helplessness are all uh, emotions that people uh, typically experience in depression. Energy is decreased. Concentration problems. Appetite in classic depression, typical depression, would, appetite would be decreased with weight loss. Um, in atypical depression, appetite is increased and weight, uh, people gain weight. Psychomotor retardation refers to the fact that people who are depressed don't feel like moving very much, may have a hard time getting off the couch or getting out of bed. And finally, again, one of those, the most important uh, experience that we want to pay attention to in depression is when somebody experiences suicidal thoughts uh, or suicidal behaviors. A uh, less severe form of that is a pass passive death wish, as we call these, when people kind of focus on death, think death might be a relief, but they don't have any uh, desire or um, will to actually act on those thoughts. When these problems, these, these five symptoms and depressed mood uh, go on for, uh, actually, I'm sorry, um, go on for two weeks, like I said, but impact our functioning in a significant way. And this, again, is an arbitrary definition, but most of us would know this when we see it. People are having trouble working. People are tr having trouble maintaining relationships. They're not engaging in good self-care. We consider that impairment of functioning. Um, and we want to rule out always whether uh, depression may be due to a substance or a medical condition, because if we don't address those, it's unlikely depression is going to get better on its own. I want to mention seasonal depression first, because for many of us, this might be uh, really important right now. Uh, in my work, I, I work with several people who, at the, by the end of August, are already starting to feel the decrease in light and the onset of seasonal depressive symptoms. And by now, many people are starting to experience that. Um, the typical definition of seasonal depression is uh, depression that starts to worsen in the fall and winter, and then spontaneously uh, improves in the spring. Um, our treatments for this include light therapy. I'm going to talk about treatment in the second half of this talk, but I'll mention it briefly here um, because it's a spe special kind of case where light therapy can be very effective in treating uh, seasonal depression. Uh, we also can use antidepressant medications. And here in, at the University of Vermont, we're actually developing uh, a s specific cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a type of therapy addressing thoughts and behaviors um, specifically directed towards seasonal affective disorder. Uh, se or seasonal depression, um, and it was recently published in our American Journal of Psychiatry in September and, and showed very good results. Um, so that's another something else that people can engage in to, to treat seasonal depression. Major depression with psychosis. Psychosis, uh, kind of a rough definition, would be an altered mental state where one sense of reality changes. Often includes things like hallucinations, seeing things or hearing things that other people don't see or hear. Uh, in uh, depression and psychosis, people may see things like seeing a loved one, um, uh, the visual hallucination of seeing um, a loved one who has passed, for example. Um, a typical uh, auditory hallucination that can occur for people when they're depressed uh, are hearing voices telling them things that are negative about themselves and putting them down. Maybe even getting to the point of what we call a command hallucination, telling you you should kill yourself because you're not a good person, for example. And that's very serious. When somebody starts having command hallucinations, they're telling you to do something to hurt someone else or yourself, that's a medical emergency and really should be uh, assessed immediately. Delusions are defined as fixed beliefs that are out of character with one's culture. A uh, couple typical uh, delusions that people might experience in the context of psychosis and depression are uh, somatic delusions. One classic uh, kind of delusion is the belief that one's insides are rotting or, one, or that one is dying. Even... This is, I just heard about this on a podcast, never heard of this before, but there's actually one that's so severe, very rare, but so severe that one believes they're dead and you can't convince them otherwise. Um, that would be the extreme form of that. Paranoid delusions are belief that uh, one is being persecuted by others. And this is generally accompanied by uh, disorganized thinking and behavior. And altogether, this tends to impact uh, one's functioning very significantly to the point usually that people usually are not taking care of themselves, not eating, drinking, sleeping, and this tends to become a medical emergency and needs to be treated uh, with inpatient hospitalization, for example. In severe forms where people might not want to take medication, we will use electroconvulsive therapy often for this kind of problem, ECT. I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
I want to talk about grieving um, and, you know, quote unquote, when is it pathological? Uh, the DSM, which is our Diagnostic Manual in Psychiatry, was recently revised, 2013, and this was a very controversial uh, part of that. Uh, they made it easier in a DSM to diagnose people who are grieving with a major depressive episode. And people are rightly concerned that this might pathologize grief to the point that we're actually going to start you know, prescribing people medication for grieving. You know, if you, you know, your loved one dies and you feel a bit sad, let's get that person into treatment right away. Um, and people are going to get overtreated. Um, and my read of that is not actually the case. If you read the DSM, which I have, uh, there's, they're very careful to say, what is, what is normal grieving, what is grieving that we would expect, and when does it become pathological. So we all experience significant losses. We might experience insomnia or appetite changes when we lose somebody or lose a job. Um, but sometimes we have to worry. And when do we worry? Uh, when symptoms become very severe. So somebody's not sleeping or eating at all and they're losing weight and we're worried about their physical health and not taking their medication if they have diabetes, for example. Uh, if symptoms persist, it's common for grief to go on, sometimes for years, actually. Um, we wouldn't be concerned about that unless the symptoms are severe and it's impacting their functioning. They're not working. They're not interacting with, with others. Um, and then it's also common when someone dies to have thoughts about maybe wanting to join that person or missing that person and somehow being connected to them. But when that turns to thoughts about actually actively wanting to kill yourself to join them, we, of course, are going to take that seriously and, and, and treat that, hopefully. So I hope that makes sense when, when we start to think about um, really taking this more seriously and treating this as, as more of a, a serious issue. Persistent depressive disorder used to be called dysthymia, which implies low-grade depressive symptoms, not quite meeting the level of a major depressive episode, but still impacting someone's function uh, enough that we're concerned and want to do something about it, and we typically treat this kind of depression the same way we would a major depressive episode. Bipolar depression uh, implies the presence of both manic episodes uh, or hypomanic episodes, which are a little bit less severe, and depressive episodes. I don't have enough time to really go into this. It's deserving of its own talk, really. It's such an um, important uh, condition. Uh, but simply to say that um, when, we, when somebody has bipolar disorder and has depression, they look the same. They're not that different when people are depressed. Trying to treat bipolar depression uh, can be difficult, and that's because many of the treatments we use for what's called unipolar depression, when somebody only experiences depression, um, can actually exacerbate uh, bipolar disorder, increase the risk of manic episodes. So if you know someone or if you are someone who has bipolar disorder and you're wondering why you know, they're not getting an antidepressant medication and what, you know, what's the problem here, I can tell you it's about the most difficult thing to treat for somebody because you're always walking that tightrope. Um, and we don't always want to focus on medications for people with bipolar disorder like we wouldn't want to do for any depressive condition. There's a lot of things we, we need to do to help people. So we want to focus on maintaining routines. It's probably the most important thing for somebody with bipolar disorder. Plenty of evidence out there showing that if we can help people sleep regular schedules, eat on a regular schedule, socialize on a regular schedule, exercise on a regular schedule, that this actually decreases the incidence of both depressive and manic episodes. Um, and then psychotherapy can also be helpful. Um, I've worked with people who have bipolar disorder but have other things. They have trauma. They have losses in their life. Often mania can be so disruptive to someone's life that friendships are ruined, uh, relationships with family members are damaged, and so psychotherapy can be very important and should always be offered to somebody with bipolar disorder. Um, so depression in the context of substance use, uh, okay, I guess I'm going to be over here. Um, very important to ask somebody about substance use, or it is for me when I, when I work with them, and very important to realize that any substance can affect psychological functioning. Anything you put in your body, whether it's water, table salt, whatever, can have some potential impact on you depending on who you are, what your genetic makeup is, what your predispositions are. Uh, so some classic um, uh, cause and effect relationships with substance, substances and depression uh, include those that can directly cause depression. Most people are familiar that alcohol is a depressant. 
um, and will worsen depression. Sedative medications, benzodiazepines like Valium, Conip, and Ativan, very widely used for anxiety, all worsen depression. Uh, marijuana can worsen mood, can worsen anxiety. Often people feel good when they first use marijuana, but um, especially chronic use can worsen mood and anxiety. Steroids used in, for a lot of treatments, autoimmune conditions, for lung conditions, uh, really anything that involves inflammation, when used systemically, when orally or IV, can really affect the mood. It throws people, can really throw people for a loop. Uh, local steroids like nasal sprays or inhalers or injections for pain, less likely to do that because they're not absorbed as widely in the body. Blood pressure medications, there are a few that can worsen depression. Um, depression can also result from substance withdrawal. So if somebody is using cocaine or amphetamines um, and stops the, and, or antidepressants that are prescribed, if you stop them abruptly, can worsen depression. And depression can also result from chronic toxic effects of, of substances. Cocaine, ecstasy, methamphetamine all have chronic neurotoxic effects. Alcohol actually can too when used for really long periods of time. So <clears throat> those types of depression are very difficult to treat because you basically burnt out a lot of the, the nervous system that helps regulate mood. There are many medical conditions that can worsen depression. And these are all important to look for um, if you have depression or if you're evaluating somebody for depression. Common ones, hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid is a very common cause of depression, especially as we get older. I think it's something like 15% of people over the age of 70 will have uh, hypothyroidism, so a common cause of depression in elders, all sorts of various ways you can get to anemia, that's a common cause, vitamin deficiencies like folate or vitamin D deficiencies, um, and, and the rest of these. The incident of, incidence of depression after stroke is up to 50%. Uh, after a hip fracture, up to a third of people will experience depression. So very high rates. One of, I don't have a lot about kids. I don't typically treat children, but I can tell you um, some basic things about kids uh, when they're depressed, you know, they may not be despondent. They may not be talking about feeling very sad even. They, it can manifest as irritability, listlessness, not being very responsive to their environment, um, anhedonia, lack of pleasure in things they used to enjoy. They don't play with their toys. They're not involved in, in activities they were. They may not be gaining weight. They may fall off the growth curve. And somatic complaints are common. So complaints of body aches, stomach aches, things like that. That's how a child might present with depression. In elders, some similar kind of presentations, actually. Irritability instead of sadness may be present, may present as somatic or pain complaints. There's a term that we don't really use anymore. It's, but it was used for a long time, pseudo-dementia, false dementia. Better term is reversible dementia because it ain't false. It's, it's real. It really um, it looks very much like what you'd see in Alzheimer's disease, um, where people have more cognitive impairment. They can't concentrate. They, they have a difficult time remembering things. Uh, what tends to be a little different, <clears throat> this isn't always the case, um, is that uh, for people with uh, dementia uh, symptoms, memory symptoms due to depression, people tend to be aware of them pretty well. Often in, in early uh, or even more advanced uh, dementias like Alzheimer's, people aren't always aware of exactly what cognitive effect, kind of effects they're experiencing, cognitive problems they're having. Um, so it's pretty common for um, people with dementia to kind of deny that they're having problems, whereas people with depression who are experiencing cognitive problems complain about it often. It's their chief complaint. It's the thing that they're most concerned about. Um, and again, as we get older, we tend to lose more people in our lives. So differentiating major depression from grieving is important. Depression during pregnancy um, is a significant concern. 10 to 25% of pregnant women will experience depression. Um, and depression during pregnancy is actually the strongest predictor of depression after pregnancy. So very important when we're considering postpartum depression. 15% of women who are untreated for depression during pregnancy will attempt suicide. So um, it's not, it's not again, not a quote unquote normal response to pregnancy. There are a lot of stressors in pregnancy, so we might expect depression would be an issue, um, but it should be uh, addressed because if it's not, there are a lot of things that can happen as far as not eating enough, therefore the baby's not growing enough, and it can be a lot of effects um, on the baby. Similarly, in postpartum depression, we see 
or after after uh, baby is born, we see high rates of mild depressive symptoms, sometimes called baby blues. Up to three quarters of women will experience this. It tends to be temporary, and it usually doesn't involve uh, impairments in social functioning or other types of functioning. So it tends to resolve on its own for most people. But up to 20% of women um, will experience a major depressive episode after uh, their child is born. Postpartum psychosis is a very serious um, issue after depression, uh, more likely to happen in bipolar uh, depression, where, and it's about one in 500 women, so it's pretty rare. Um, and this can occur anywhere from two days to four weeks after delivery, involving uh, symptoms of psychosis, delusions and hallucinations, mood swings, confusion, disorganized behavior. It is a medical emergency. Um, about 5% of women who experience this will try to kill themselves or kill their infant. So most cases of infanticide, the ones that are you know, highly publicized in the media, involves postpartum psychosis. So very important to address this as soon as it, it happens. So that's kind of the, the spectrum of depression. What can we do about it? So here's an, one approach, my approach to recovery from depression. If depression is less intense, less severe, and hasn't been ha you know, gone on for too long, um, the best thing we can do is engage in good self-care. Often people who are starting to experience depression, uh, they start to let these things go. Uh, so diet, they tend not to eat as well or eat food that's really not going to make them feel so great. Uh, they don't exercise anymore. Um, they're not engaging in self-care like meditation. And recently I heard this podcast on a TED radio hour, one of the best I've heard in a long time, about the topic of play. And in there, in this podcast, um, there's a researcher on play. Sounds like a great job. I wish I had that one. Um, he said uh, in his talk, he said, um, the opposite of play is not work. It's depression. And when I heard that, not only because I knew I was giving this talk, but you know, also just reflecting back on my own life and, and, and the work that I do, this is often the case. People who are depressed don't play. They don't have enjoyment in their lives. And I, that will obviously lead to not feeling as good as you would otherwise. When they talk about play in adults, this includes sports, this includes art, this includes uh, a whole bunch of social activities that we engage in. They talked about how play engages all parts of the brain. It's kind of like music in that regard where it engages many parts of the brain and brings them together um, to work together. So I wanted to mention that and put a plug in for play, big for that. Uh, social support often falls by the wayside, so making sure we, when we start to feel depressed, not cutting ourselves off from social connections. If we have a hard time doing that in our lives, looking for support groups where other people know what we're going through um, can help us, uh, can be very vital. Behavioral activation, I'll talk about exactly what I mean a little bit about that, but it basically involves getting active again when we start to get depressed. And then bibliotherapy is a fancy term for self-help books. And there are many good ones on, on the topic of depression. So if we start to get depressed, these are some things we can do to kind of hopefully stop the process and reverse it. But if it gets more intense and more persistent, I'm going to talk to you about some other things you can do. So I'm going to go through some of the self-care evidence first and then go into the more of the you know, technical treatment uh, things that, that we can do. Uh, there's extensive literature showing benefits of, of physical exercise in terms of both preventing depression and helping us recover from depression. And whereas for cardiovascular health, studies are pretty clear that moderate levels of exercise, 30 minutes of like walking five times a week, very helpful and um, help us stay healthy. In depression, you want to push it a little bit harder, actually, if you want to get the maximal benefits. So more vigorous exercise, including weight, weightlifting, um, has been shown maybe to be a little bit more helpful than less intense forms of exercise. The studies that are out there are, are limited. And you see this any time when a drug company is not supporting it, um, because who's going to make a lot of money off you know, weightlifting and, and yoga? Um, doesn't have a big industry out there yet. Yoga, I guess, has got a pretty big industry behind it. But um, still, the studies aren't there. But because there's so many other benefits, we can all get behind recommending exercise for depression. Uh, if you are considering an exercise regimen, got to put the caveat in there. Always consult a physician before you start if you haven't been engaging in exercise or if you have any physical limitations that, that you might be concerned about. Yoga specifically as a form of exercise has, again, been looked at a lot. Um, several studies have shown it can reduce depressive symptoms, lead to remission from depression, and I like the side effects. So, um, and I, I, as a practitioner, I can say, you know, 
nothing's better for my mood than yoga, so I, I can recommend that wholeheartedly, even though the studies at this point are pretty small. Bibliotherapy, self-help books, CBT refers to cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the most researched uh, therapy for depression at this point. And there are several books um, that have been written that you can read, go through, and recover from depression. Actually, studies that show these books can be as effective as some therapy done by therapists. Now, once we get past the self-help things that we can do and the self-care things we can do, um, we're looking at treatment. And um, the most important thing before we start treatment for any problem is to do a good assessment. So if you, um, psychiatry is not widely available uh, anywhere these days. We're becoming more and more rare. Um, there's many reasons behind that. So most people, when they're trying to come up with a treatment plan for depression, it's going to be coordination between your primary care doctor who, by and large, manage, they actually do like 80% of the psychiatric prescribing in America. So they're familiar with most of the things that are out there and generally pretty good, I find, at least in this area. Um, so you're generally going to work with your, your primary care doctor. And um, I always recommend talk therapy. I think it's by far the, the safest and most effective option for depression. I mean, roughly effective to medications, but in the long term, it's going to lead to better effects long term. In the short term, it's about as effective as medication, but long term, I think there are benefits in terms of prevention of depression. Um, and so I'd always recommend that. So seeing a mental health care specialist if your depression is risen to the level of a major depressive episode is what I would recommend. I want to comment here, and I'll talk more about this, that if one is having suicidal thoughts, you don't want to schedule your appointment for your, you know, your PCP four weeks from now and get on the wait list somewhere for therapy. You treat, you got to get that addressed immediately. I'll tell you how to do that in a little bit. Goals for depression treatment, frequent contact with those people you're working for with regard to treatment. Got to communicate your, your pre uh, preferences to professionals. Um, I'll speak as, as somebody who does this work all the time. It's so helpful to me when somebody comes in with what they want and what they don't want and speaks up about it. Even if I seem to be driving you know, the conversation in a certain direction, it's so helpful when somebody says, stop. And this is, I don't want anything to do with these medications. I'm interested in this. Um, yeah, I'm interested in talk therapy. That's a great thing. And if you're working with somebody who's not receptive to that, get another provider, get somebody else to work with. Always communicate your preferences. We always want to try to un correct underlying issues that might be driving depression first. So, for example, if somebody has a, you know, is drinking alcohol and they're you know, to a point where it seems to be impacting depression, we want to try to decrease that alcohol use or stop it. Now, studies have shown in terms of substance use, you don't wait. This used to be the thing that, that was recommended back, I think, even before I was trained, but I heard about this, that you got to stop your drinking first. Once you've had six months of sobriety, come back and we'll treat your depression. People actually did research on that and found that was absolutely not effective. You want to treat both together. So if you have a severe depression and you have some alcohol issues, treat both those together. If you have severe depression and you have anemia, treat the anemia, but also get help for the depression. You might want to wait, like on a medication, for example, but if there's other issues that you want to walk, work on a therapy, do the therapy while you're getting your anemia corrected, by all means. You want to avoid iatrogenic worsening. Iatrogenic is a fancy word, meaning the doctor's making you worse. Uh, we don't want to do that. So, for example, if I'm prescribing a blood pressure medication to you and your depression's going down the tubes, we stop the blood pressure medication and try a different blood pressure medication. Be surprised how often that doesn't happen. Benzodiazepines, particularly, it's what I see because it's something the psychiatrists prescribe, but people come to me depressed for a few years and they've been on a pretty high dose of a benzodiazepine and nobody's ever told them that can worsen your depression, tried stopping it. You stop it, lo and behold, depression gets better. You want to minimize or utilize side effects to our advantage for using medication. By utilize side effects, I mean there are some antidepressants, for example, that are sedating. And if you're having a lot of problems sleeping, a sedating antidepressant can be just the thing for you. And we want to treat aggressively. All the studies that have looked at treatment of depression show that you don't want to treat to uh, response, meaning like a third, 33% decrease in symptoms or a 50% decrease in symptoms. You want to bring depression symptoms down as low as you possibly can. If you do that, you have less chance of remission and you have better long-term outcomes. So that's always the goal. 
You don't want to go halfway. Now, people often drop out of treatment and about, they're getting about halfway better and, okay, thanks a lot, I'm done. So it's important to explain to people in the beginning of treatment, we want to stay together and, and work this out until you know, it's pretty much gone and you're feeling good and stable for three to six months and then we can talk about kind of a maintenance plan. How well do our treatments work? Um, only half of people with depression actually get treatment for it, and this is pretty typical for a lot of medical conditions in our society. But those who do, 80 to 90 percent of people will see, uh, will get better from, from treatment. So they do work. Here's another way of representing that. This is from a very good book. Um, I can't remember Kirsch's first name, but his, his book is The Emperor's New Drugs, which is a great book about treatment of depression, the placebo effect, and his critique of antidepressants as nothing more than active placebos, he calls them, um, meaning that they give you some side effects, so therefore you think you're taking something that's actually doing its job, and that's why you get better, and not because it's like correcting a chemical imbalance kind of thing. So great book, recommend it. Um, this is a, a, a graph from his book, and it shows that uh, these, these are um, numbers on a side are 0 to 1.6 are effect sizes. Effect sizes are one way to measure the effectiveness of any intervention. A good effect size, 0.7, is generally considered a good effect size. You can see for medications, antidepressant medications, and psychotherapy for, for depression, 1.6 is the effect size that we see. That's a re remarkably robust effect size. There's really nothing better in, in, in any other medication in all of medicine. But if you look right next to it, those two columns, you see placebo. Placebos look pretty darn effective, 1.1 effect size. So what does that say? What that says is that the main driver of placebo effect is expectation. And if you can harness that within yourself, the expectation that you will get better, very, most of the time you're gonna get better. I love placebo effect, too. I have a whole talk on placebo effect at some point, maybe I'll offer that at some point, but it's really interesting stuff. Um, and then, but if you look at no treatment at all, 0.4. So we definitely want to treat depression. Despite all the controversies around medications, um, they do work. I'm going to start with psychotherapies because that's what I'm partial to. I think those tend to be the best treatments for depression. And when you look at research that has been done, uh, most evidence is there for, is for cognitive behavioral therapies, CBT. And that is the idea that if we change our thoughts and our behaviors, we tend to experience less depression. Uh, interpersonal therapy is another type of therapy. Uh, grew out of psychodynamic Freudian type of therapies that focus on relationships, role transitions, and grieving. Also very effective consistently for depression. Uh, some other uh, evidence exists for psychodynamic therapy. This kind of goes out of the Freudian school of, of psychoanalysis, addressing unconscious drives and defenses. Uh, behavioral activation therapy, problem solving therapy, kind of what it sounds like, and social skills training, training people in social skills has also been shown to be helpful. What's found to be less helpful is kind of a non-directive uh, type of counseling where you show up and just talk about what's going on in your life and not having more focus to it. So that generally is not as effective. And if you're seeing somebody for depression, that's what you're doing, and you're not getting better, you might want to look at one of the other kind of therapies to see if that might be more effective for you. But when we look at effective therapy, studies are pretty clear that when you compare CBT to interpersonal therapy to psychodynamic therapy, most of the head-to-head -head studies show there's not much different. Um, what matters most? Well, about 80% of what is, um, about 80% of um, treatment effect, of, of, of what tends to lead to positive outcomes in treatment, is what you bring to therapy. So what you're walking in with is about 80% of the treatment effect. And most important things there are positive expectation and a sense of self-efficacy, like I can do this. I can get myself better. So if you go into therapy, that's what you want to go in with. Um, and if you're working with a therapist, hopefully they're going to elicit that from you if you don't have it to start with. A lot of people with depression don't have that. Um, but that is the most important thing in therapy. The, about the other 20%, the most important part of uh, outcome is the alliance you have with your therapist. So if you're working with a therapist and you're going now maybe a few months and it's not really gelling for you, there's good evidence to show that that probably is not going to work very well for you and you probably should look for another therapist. And that there's also good evidence to show that within the first six to 12 sessions, most progress happens in that time. It doesn't matter if it's cognitive behavioral therapy, which is traditionally a 12-week 
program or psychodynamic therapy, which is traditionally a longer type of therapy. Most change happens in the first several sessions. If you're not seeing it and you're kind of going along for three, six months and it's not, you're not seeing much benefit, you may want to think about finding another therapist. It's hard to go and talk to somebody else again about everything that's happened to you. I know it, there's a lot of resistance to that in the people I work with, but it is something I recommend uh, to people. I want to talk about behavioral activation therapy because this is something we can do for ourselves, actually. Um, the idea behind behavioral activation therapy is that there's a vicious cycle. Depression tends to lead to avoidance and withdrawal from our relationships, from our job, from uh, our thoughts and feelings, and that tends to worsen our depression. So we get this vicious cycle. What we try to do then is create a virtuous cycle in which we increase our activity, decrease avoidance, and start to decrease the intensity of depression. How do we do that? We create self-monitoring. This often involves uh, maybe a, a one, diary, one sheet diary um, that breaks up your week into individual days, individual hours, and you start to schedule activities you know that you enjoy, that you know get your energy level up. Um, and in the beginning, you might schedule only one a day. Uh, the next week, you might schedule two a day. The next week, you might schedule three. And as you start to get more energy and more joy out of things, um, you start to just keep, ma keep and maintain that structure and that routine can help depression. What also helps is to reflect back after you do something. You might do it this, uh, this kind of borrows from cognitive behavioral therapy as well, where you rate your estimate of how much enjoyment you're going to get from an activity beforehand, and then you rate it again afterward. And you see how that compares. And most people will find, ugh, when you're depressed, I don't, you know, 10% chance I'm going to like going for that walk. After you do it, actually 95% rate of enjoyment from doing that walk. I feel good that I did it. I feel good to get the exercise. Um, and that's a pretty powerful thing cognitively to get in our minds. Just because I may not look forward to something when I'm depressed, I may actually enjoy it after I do it. So I probably should go ahead and do it. And we may have to explore alternative behaviors. Maybe the things that give us enjoyment before don't give us enjoyment now. And I have to think about other ways to experience enjoyment in my life. So that's basically behavioral activation therapy in a nutshell. But many books on depression will talk about that, by the way, and, and help you build that into your life. I'll talk about medications next. Uh, I'm going to kind of breeze through these. Um, there's a lot of information there. There are all these drug names. But I just want you to know when I'm talking about SSRI is what I'm talking about. Most people have heard of Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil. That's the SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. By the way, there's no proof that serotonin has anything to do with depression. All right? The whole chemical imbalance theory, no, no, no proof that all that's true. We don't know how these medications work. If anybody tells you different, they're lying. We don't know how. There's a lot of theories. There's theories that, well, first of all, the whole serotonin thing, as soon as you increase serotonin in the brain, the body decreases receptors for serotonin within a few days, weeks. So it's not, the serotonin transmission is the same. Um, there may be changes in a nucleus. There may be you know, secondary proteins that are generated, maybe an active placebo effect. We really don't know. But there is no, there's no evidence for the chemical imbalance theory that serotonin particularly is related to depressive uh, depression or its recovery. And there's good evidence that for mild to moderate depression that these medications are not very effective. Some of you look puzzled, but it's true. If you're interested, you can contact me afterward. I can actually send you some of those review articles that look at that. And actually, Kirsch talks about that in his book. So I can direct you to that as well. And all, when we use these medications for severe forms of depression, all are about are equally effective. So there used to be a time when the drug companies, when they were making a lot of money off these meds, were, were trying to tell you this is more effective for this or less side effects. Yeah, it's, none of it's true. And the rates of side effects are about the same as older medications. That was another thing. These are safer and less side effect prone than the medications we used in the 1970s and 80s. Studies have shown that's not true either. Though the, the side effects in this class might be a little more tolerable than the, the, the older medications. Serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, they're a newer class as well. This includes things like Effexor, Cymbalta, Pristique, and a new one called Fetzema. This increases norepinephrine levels which generally norepinephrine levels increasing in our body give us a bit more energy, make us a bit more alert, but also give us more headaches and more jittery too. So it's a trade-off. They they're possibly more effective for depression and even some anxiety disorders. Um, they, they, the studies are pretty clear that these medications seem to be better for pain. That's one, that's one thing that tends to separate them out 
from SSRIs. So if one has a pain disorder we're generally gonna, and, and they also have depression, we're generally going to rely on this or the next class of medication I'll talk about, the tricyclic antidepressants. There is more risk for side effects with these medications. So there are plenty of risks when you, when you sign up to take one of these medications, plenty of side effects, headache, irritability, GI symptoms, insomnia. Sexual dysfunction is very high in some studies, up to like 50, 60, 70 percent in some studies. Often not reported. People don't want to talk about it. But if you're having this, you want to report it to your doctor that, that you're having it because it can be managed and, and you, a lot of things you can do about that. But if you don't tell the person prescribing it, uh, they're not going to know. Um, so, so far, this seems really good to you. Like, sign me up. Well, how about risk of GI bleed, low sodium levels, low bone density, liver function problems, and cardiac problems? No? I'll get some more for you. If you're under 25, it increases your risk for suicidality. So there's a lot of controversy about suicide risk and antidepressants. Most of that risk is age 25 or under. And the younger you are, the more that risk is there. Now, I can tell you I've treated people over 25, and I have seen it happen in isolated instances um, where they get on the medication. They feel really often related to the agitation that can occur with these medications and, and what we call dysphoria, just feeling irritable and not feeling well, um, can lead to suicidality. So if you're starting this medication or you're in your work, you know somebody who's starting a medication, you want to be in frequent contact in the beginning. Nobody should go more than two weeks after starting a medication like this, an antidepressant, without seeing their doctor. And if you have suicidality, contact your doctor immediately. If you know somebody who's having it, you contact their doctor immediately if they don't want to do it. It's very important this is addressed. Stop the medicine. That's another thing. I, I'm surprised how many people continue to take the medicine when they're feeling suicidal. don't want to give you medical advice, but if you're feeling suicidal from medicine, please stop it. Get help immediately. There are other second-generation medications, newer medications, relatively. These come out in the last 20 years uh, that you may have heard of. Mirtazapine, or also known as Remeron. Very nice medicine as far as side effects generally, but it does tend to cause sedation and weight gain. Not everybody gains weight on it. And so I do use this medicine pretty frequently with the caveat that if you start to gain weight or your appetite's markedly increased, especially for carbohydrates, let me know immediately and we'll often have to stop this medicine if that's the case. But for about the 75% of people who don't have that, it can be a very nice medication. Well, butrin, bupropion is not an, a serotonin medicine. It's a dopamine norepinephrine medicine, similar to amphetamine uh, and how it works. Um, so the benefits of that are it doesn't cause sexual dysfunction. Sexual dysfunction uh, in most antidepressants is related to the effects of serotonin in the body. Um, because this doesn't affect serotonin, you don't tend to get the sexual dysfunction you get with other antidepressants. But there is more risk for headaches, jitteriness, appetite suppression. If you have an eating disorder, it can increase the risk for seizures. Trazodone, we don't really use this for depression so much anymore because it's so darn sedating, but it can be helpful for um, add-on use for, for sleep. Tricyclic antidepressants are an older class of medications. The original antidepressants, imipramine, uh, discovered in the 1950s. I think it was being investigated as a tuberculosis drug, if, or maybe that was another one. But it was, it was definitely being investigated for other uses, and they found that people were seen to perk up when they were on it. So they then explored all these classes of medications that all share this tricyclic basic chemical struct, uh, structure, and they all seem to help depression, anxiety, pain, things like this. So where I will use these medications is somebody comes to see me and they have severe depression and they're anxious and they're not sleeping and they have chronic pain. This can be a very nice medication that kind of addresses all of those issues. However, there, there are risks, uh, really potentially very serious risks with these medicines. Sedation, weight gain, lowering your blood pressure. There's something called anticholinergic effects, which we now know any medicine that causes anticholinergic effects increases the risk of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, especially the longer you use it. What are some anticholinergic effects that you may know of or be on other than antidepressants? Uh, bladder medications like Ditropan or Detrol-LA work directly by anticholinergic effects. Um, and uh, Benadryl, over-the-counter antihistamines. So a lot of people are taking these things like candy to sleep, which they're terrible sleep medications. I don't recommend them for that. But they also cause dry mouth and constipation, urinary retention, mental confusion. And uh, in the long term, if you use them, can increase the risk for dementia. I've had patients come to me on 25 of these at bedtime. They're taking 25 tablets. Um, and what happens often is people will be on them for about three days. They don't work well anymore. Add another one. Might work a little better. 
for a few days, add another one. And tolerance is very rapid for treatment of insomnia. So if you know anybody who's using Tylenol PM, ibuprofen PM, um, what is somebody does one, Saminol or something, all those over-the-counter stuff, they're all antihistamines. They all have anticholinergic effects. You should not be using those chronically. One night or two would be okay, but not repeatedly. Tricyclic is the thing that we were worried about most. And the reason these were so, antidepressants were so limited in their use before Prozac came out is that you could um, overdose on them and kill yourself very easily. That's because they tend to cause heart block, so that the conduction of the impulse in the heart from the atria to the ventricles um, can be blocked by these medications and precipitate, precipitate deadly arrhythmias. After an overdose on these medications, uh, somebody should be monitored for up to 72 hours because it does not always present itself in the first few hours after an overdose. The risk is highest within the first 24 hours, but can persist after that. That is the, I didn't, I don't even talk about MAOIs today. Oh. That's another class of medicines. Okay. I, I've never prescribed one, and they're so complicated. That's another class of older antidepressant that we really don't use very much anymore. And so that, that would be, yeah, that's, uh, those, are, those are really tough to use because of those dietary limitations. So I want to talk just briefly about, I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but when one is not experiencing an improvement on medications, we typically want to give about four to 12 weeks, depending on who you are, what demographics you have. Um, it can go four to 12 weeks for a full trial of a medication at a dose. So often what happens is people do not stay on them long enough. People do not increase the dose beyond the initial starting dose. These are all mistakes that are commonly made. But if you do get a full response, if you get um, um, you know, a full 12 weeks at a fairly good dose of one of these medications, um, we're then thinking about switching. Now, if somebody gets a partial response, maybe their, their symptoms decrease by about half, um, then we have a uh, possibility of augmenting, adding another medication in to help them. Now, what I have seen happen, um, people have come to me, um, is switching or augmenting too soon. I've even seen people get started, this happens actually at a couple hospitals in our state, unfortunately, where people will get started on two medications for depression at the same time. Which to me, there's an argument, there are some studies showing actually that that might improve uh, response, like get people to respond faster. But what I usually see, actually what I've always seen, is um, people develop side effects. You get out of the hospital, it's, not, it's a different environment. Now people are experiencing agitation, anxiety, sweating, all these terrible side effects because they got on these two medications at the same time. Also, who knows, maybe you could have gotten better just with one medication, why not try that first? So I, I am a strong proponent of trying one medication at a time, not augmenting too early. There are many choices for augmentation, including different types of antidepressants together, antipsychotic medication, et cetera. I'm not going to get too much in detail on that today, but there are many options for that. Briefly, I want to talk about other medical interventions that we use to treat depression. ECT is the one that we've used the longest. Also very controversial. A lot of negative media depiction, and, it, and for good reason, it was misused for many, many years um, before we started doing this in a much better way in the last 20, 30 years, 40 years even, like in the 70s, early 80s, we started transitioning to using anesthesia while people get ECT treatments. Um, it's very effective for severe and chronic depression by far more effective than any other intervention we have. So if you've been on multiple medication trials, you've been in psychotherapy, you're not getting better, and you don't have a life because of your depression, I would certainly consider ECT, certainly consider a consultation to discuss the potential benefits and risks. I can't go too much into detail today because of the limited amount of time I have, but um, it is certainly something we should consider when we're feeling very depressed. There are side effects that can usually be managed. For some people, they can't. And there can be long-term effects. I'm not under, you know, underestimating that at all. I know some people have described long-term memory issues with this and other cognitive issues, um, but it should be considered. Transmagnetic stimulation is a newer type of intervention. It was supposed to try to give us the benefit of ECT without the problems because it involves placing a magnet uh, focally over certain parts of the brain and stimulating at a certain uh, rate and hopefully uh, helping depression. The evidence we have so far is not that great. There's some benefit, the FDA looked at this, and they have a pretty limited parameters by which you can use um, this intervention. It is less, si less prone to side effects than other interventions, even medications probably, but not terribly effective, especially compared to ECT. 
And for back about 10 years ago, vagal nerve stimulation, which actually implanting a nerve stimulator in your neck, was approved by the FDA. Very controversial. I totally disagreed with that. Um, Consumer Reports did an excellent, I think, no, no, it was Public Citizen who did an excellent review of all the literature at that time and basically tore it apart. So I don't know anybody who's gotten this. I wouldn't recommend anybody get this. Um, causes lots of side effects. Vocal changes, um, discomfort, uh, a lot of potential issues, and the data for effectiveness are very limited. Other depression treatments out there, I want to talk about light therapy, which I tend to be a big fan of. Um, there are many types of light therapy, what we call bright light therapy, which is the typical uh, definition of that is 10,000 lux, which is lux or a measure of intensity of light. 10,000 lux are the ones that are mostly out there, and that's the one that has the most evidence base. So I would definitely recommend 10,000 lux bright light therapy to those who have depression. Um, at the same time, I want to say this is not... Um, I want. I would want people to think of this as a medical intervention, carrying risk for side effects, carrying the risk of, uh, of um, possibly instigating bipolar uh, disorder, possibly creating mania in people who are susceptible, uh, causing potential sleep problems if misused, not used correctly. So <clears throat> should be used in conjunction with somebody who knows how to manage light therapy. Um, everybody's different, and you have to take everybody's you know, factors into consideration to do this right. Generally, it's going to be a 30 minutes first thing in the morning sort of thing, using the light very close so you get the 10,000 lux effect. If you're using it you know, at this distance, you're not going to get any effect. If it's not shining in your eyes, you're not going to get any effect. But you don't want to use it more than 30 minutes typically. You don't want to use it throughout the day. You don't want to use it late in the day because it will suppress your melatonin later in the day and you won't sleep well. So there's a lot of things to consider. If you're having headaches, if your, your sleep starts to suffer, stop using it. Um, so it is a medical intervention. The evidence shows that bright light treatment and something called dawn simulation treatment, there are um, devices that do dawn simulation that basically starts out dark and then gradually brings up light to about a 200 lux level, which is very low. But studies have shown that if you have this by your bedside, um, it tends to be effective for seasonal depression. If you don't like that bright light shining in your face, that might be an option. Um, for non-seasonal depression, so, so depression where there's not a seasonal variant, um, um, bright light has also been shown to be effective, roughly effective to antidepressant medication. So you know, if your depression is a non-seasonal variant, using light therapy is an option to treat it if you don't want to use medication, for example. Um, some studies show light treatment works faster with lower rates of side effects than antidepressants. It certainly has a lot to re uh, you know, recommend it. St. John's wort is a commonly used herbal medication um, for depression. Um, European studies tend to be more robust than the uh, American studies that have been done. Uh, who knows why? The Europeans really like to use herbs generally more than we do in this country. That might be part of it. But um, this may be more effective for depression in mild to moderate forms of depression rather than severe forms. So that's one place to consider it. Uh, important to note that St. John's wort has lots of drug-drug interactions. Herbs have lots of chemicals in them, many of them. Um, they all have to be processed by the liver, for example. And when you throw, put anything through your liver, it can affect how the liver metabolizes other substances. This can, St. John's wort is believed to increase serotonin levels, uh, one, thing's that, one thing that it does. So using an antidepressant with St. John's wort, not a good idea generally. Uh, it can also decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptive pills. Generally not a good idea to use those two things together. SAM E is a, a uh, supplement. It's a uh, metabolite involved in, in the synthesis of neurotransmitters. Dozens of sh studies have shown positive effects, mostly in Europe. Only a few small studies in the U.S. There are side effects very comparable to the rate of side effects we see in antidepressants, and it's quite pricey, something like a dollar or two dollars a pill. So not getting a lot of benefit over standard antidepressant treatment. Omega-3 fatty acids have some evidence to show that they're effective for depression, but the studies are variable. Uh, one place, um, one thing that they may do is help antidepressants work better. And one place where these might be helpful is in context of bipolar depression. If you have bipolar disorder, and for whatever reason other antidepressants uh, are not available to you, Considering an omega-3 fatty acid trial is certainly worth uh, 
it's certainly worth considering. Maybe good for heart health, though the data on that aren't so great either. Um, and it's got a benign side effect profile. So overall, if I was having a depression that was not responding to treatment or a milder form of depression, I wanted to try something that was a little more on the natural side of things, I might try omega-3 fatty acid supplements. There's some evidence that supplementing vitamin D can be helpful to treat depression, generally only in the context of low vitamin D levels. So this is something I commonly look for if I'm evaluating somebody for depression. Very common in this, these parts, this far north, to see low vitamin D levels. Anything, it's like 30 nanograms per milliliter. Anything lower than that is considered deficient and I think uh, worthy of supplementing. There are other risks to low vitamin D levels as well, cancer risk, cardiovascular health, et cetera. So it probably makes sense to supplement that. Although data on, sub, data on low vitamin D levels is clear, it increases the risk of these things. Data on supplementation is not so robust yet. We don't know if, if actually supplementing vitamin D actually helps correct these problems yet. Vit, vit, uh, vitamin B folate um, has some evidence in augmenting antidepressants. There's anecdotal evidence to show that it might help people with mood by itself. It's certainly pretty benign. Um, whatever, the thing about vitamin B is that whatever you don't use, you pee right out. And that's why it gives you green, greenish yellow urine when you, when you take it. It's going right out. There are a lot of other things that have been suggested to be helpful for depression that we don't have a lot of evidence. Things like acupuncture, aromatherapy, uh, et cetera. Um, some of these I can recommend because I think they're just generally good for you. Meditation, massage therapy, relaxation, guided imagery. Uh, no real serious side effects there. So. These are other things to consider in treatment of depression. I want to talk about treatment of depression during pregnancy. Again, very controversial and for good reason. Um, generally, we want to use psychotherapy if we can during pregnancy and avoid medications along with good self-care. If you're taking antidepressant prior to pregnancy, it's, again, controversial what we should recommend. Stopping, studies show that stopping a medication during pregnancy can increase the risk for relapse of depression during pregnancy. However, if somebody really wants to be very much on the safe side, not comfortable with the risk, stopping it slowly, not abruptly, dramatically decreases the risk of a depressive relapse. Um, and it's important to note that blood supply between mother and fetus is not established something I think at the seventh or eighth week. Maybe a little wrong on that, but it's right around that time. You do have some time to try to decrease this medication. Uh, although most people find out they're pregnant around you know, four, to f you know, four to six weeks, we do have a little time um, there to try to decrease this. Um, antidepressant safety has been looked at pretty extensively at this point. There seems to be, always be another study coming out on this. It does not look like uh, antidepressants or teratogens. It do doesn't seem to increase the risk of birth defects, other than Paxil, which has a slight increase in causing birth defects. As opposed to some other drugs, the risk for antidepressant use appears to be later in pregnancy. Um, there is a, there's a abstinence syndrome um, in uh, infants that we can see, including irritability, abnormal breathing patterns, disrupted sleep. And there is something called persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. Your pulmonary artery goes from your heart to your lungs, and the blood pressure in that artery can be markedly increased. And this can affect cardiovascular functioning. It's rare, but it's there, and it's much, much increased in antidepressants. So what I generally recommend for, for most women, if they can, is to come off the medication slowly. If we find we can't do that because depression worsens severely, and there's a risk to being depressed during pregnancy. It's also been shown to have uh, negative impacts on um, infants. So we might continue them, uh, continue women on an antidepressant, but about a month before delivery, I'll try to taper them off. And usually, if we do that, Depression does not come back before delivery, and then after delivery, we'll, we'll usually restart the medication. So that's one strategy. But it's always individualized. You can't generalize. Does it get aggressive? Thanks for that uh, question. That'll be the next thing I want to talk about. Um, fluoxetine and sertraline, Prozac and Zoloft have the most safety data in pregnancy. So um, after uh, the baby is born in postpartum treatment, psychotherapy, again, is the treatment of choice. There's not actually interesting a lot of data on treating postpartum depression with antidepressants. In terms of breastfeeding, we're generally going to avoid using antidepressants in breastfeeding, but the three medications that have been shown to be um, have no concentration in breast milk are paroxetine, sertraline, and nortriptyline. So 
I have had women, uh, women I've worked with breastfeed with, with these medications. In kids, I'm going to keep, keep saying that psychotherapies are generally the most effective. And for kids, they're probably, antidepressants have been shown to be the least effective of any age group and um, with increased risks um, for suicidality. So good reason to generally avoid these in kids. Um, we're going to use lower doses with kids, obviously. In elders, we want to treat medical conditions uh, that might impact depression, like pain and insomnia, but especially pain. You're going to want to stop any drugs that worsen depression. That, uh, psychotherapies are generally as effective as in younger adults. And we will use antidepressants, um, but there are a few things to, to be uh, concerned about. One is our metabolism slows down the older we get, so we got to use lower doses of medication. There's more sensitivity to side effects. We want to use lower doses of medication. And there are certain concerning effects like anticholinergic effects, sedating effects, blood pressure lowering effects. Um, all these things can affect things like memory, concentration, and fall risk. We've got to be really worried about fall risk in elders. Um, hip fractures are linked to not only worsening depression, but mortality. Finally, I want to wrap up with a discussion of depression and suicide. Uh, because this is the, the, the most dreaded outcome in, in someone who is depressed. Uh, over 90% of people who die by suicide have clinical depression and other mental health diagnosis. 15% of those in major depression attempt suicide at one point. So one of the highest risks of any psychiatric condition. Suicidal thinking is never a normal response to stress. Thoughts, gestures, or behavior require immediate attention. It's the 10th leading cause of uh, death in the U.S. across all ages at a rate of 12.1 per 100,000. Suicide had decreased uh, in the early 2000s and now has increased again back to the current level. It's about 38,000 people per year. One of every 25 suicide attempts is successful. About 250,000 people become suicide survivors every year. Um, in terms of age, Disparities. It's the second leading cause of death for those aged 15 to 24, and the fourth, fourth leading cause of death, 18 to 65. The highest risk group are in males, 50 plus, even higher in 75 plus, up to 3,600. It's almost three times as high as the general population in, in males over 75. I'm going to talk about some other risk factors in a second. For women, the highest risk time is uh, between ages 45 and 54. Females are more likely to have suicidal thoughts and attempt three times more than males. But males complete suicide attempts four times more likely and therefore represent about 80% of suicides. Firearms, and the reason that males tend to have higher rates of suicide uh, completion are that they tend to use more lethal means, firearms being the number one thing that they use to kill themselves. But hanging also um, is another uh, common type um, that males use more than females. Poisoning, typically by overdose on medication, is the, the most common method of suicide in females. Some risk factors. Um, I mean, it's shocking to see that 41% of those who identify as transgender attempt suicide at some point in their life, and those who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, 10 to 20% will attempt suicide in their life. Those who attempt suicide have already attempted suicide. 50% uh, of people successfully suicide have actually attempted before. So it's, a, it's a, probably the biggest uh, individual risk factor. If you're divorced, widowed, or single, Caucasian or Native American, or if you're actively using substances, you're, you're about the highest risk group you can be. Adverse or traumatic life events, such as physical or sexual abuse or bullying, family history of suicide, mental health or substance use, family violence, access to firearms, chronic physical illness, including chronic pain, and exposure to suicidal behavior of others. There have been epidemiologic studies showing that after a suicide of a famous person, there rates of suicide increase. And so that's why there's some talk, and I think the media actually tries to do this, is to try to minimize coverage in the most part of, of, suicide, uh, of suicides. But uh, of course, it's impossible to do that completely. What are some warning signs of uh, suicide, uh, suicide might be imminent? Uh, somebody's depression worsens. Anxiety, agitation, insomnia are all risk factors for acute um, likelihood of suicide. So we want to treat all these problems. If somebody is depressed and suicidal, if they have 
concomitant anxiety, agitation, or insomnia, we want to treat that aggressively. Anhedonia, increased anhedonia, having a death wish, engaging behaviors that, that uh, could possibly lead to death, frequently talking or thinking about death, making a plan, something we always ask about when we evaluate people for suicide, do you have a plan, what is the plan? And if somebody's talking to you about, you know, can you get me a gun, uh, where can I get some rope, can I have access to your pills, you know, start thinking about that, or start, know that risk is increased. If somebody's seeking these things out, um, <clears throat> know that the risk is, uh, is increased. If somebody's making comments about being hopeless, helpless, or worthless, it would be better if I wasn't here, I want out. Somebody starts to put their affairs in order, updates their will. They start to call people, say goodbye. And one thing that can be paradoxical, right before someone commits suicide, if they've been talking about it, you're really worried, all of a sudden they seem much calmer, happier, assured. What may be happening is that they've made that, the decision to do it and they see a way out of their pain. And so it's important if you see this in somebody who's suicidal, not to, not to let our guard down and really to ask what's going on for you right now and, and see if we, we might be able to help them talk about this decision they may have made. So some common misconceptions about suicide, people who talk about it won't do it. That's not true. Almost everyone who attempts suicide talks about it. Mo almost everyone is ambivalent about committing suicide, so they start to talk about it. If a person's determined to kill her, him or herself, they're going to do it. Also not true. Most people don't want to do it. They have this impulse. They want the pain to end, but they also don't want to do this. They want another option out. People who commit suicide were unwilling to seek help. That's not true. Studies have shown that in the month prior to suicide, uh, most people have talked about it to someone else. Um, most people have uh, talk, seen a medical provider, even if they have not talked about it, uh, the suicide uh, itself, they have seen a medical provider before they did it. Talking about suicide with someone may give them the idea. I remember having this idea when I started my training, being uncomfortable talking about it, worried that this was going to bring something up for somebody. They had never thought of this. Well, it's ridiculous. Anybody who's been depressed, the thought has crossed their mind that I don't want this pain. It'd be better if I didn't have this pain. And maybe one of the ways to do that is to die. So it always makes sense to ask about it. It's, if you know somebody has suicidal thoughts, it makes sense to, to engage in them uh, in a discussion about it. People want to talk. People want to feel some relief and, and don't want to feel so lonely with this very painful, these painful feelings and these painful thoughts. What should we do if someone we know is suicidal? Never leave them alone, if, especially if they're, you know, they're saying they're, they really feel like they're close to doing this. We don't want to argue, dispute, belittle someone, harangue somebody. You know, what are you thinking? What, what's wrong with you? Terrible, terrible strategy. What we do want to do is stay calm. We want to listen to what they're saying. We want to validate their pain. We want to validate, well, I can see why you might be wanting to think about this. I wouldn't want to feel as bad as you do. Those kind of connecting statements, that's what we need to do when someone's suicidal. We want to encourage people to talk. Doesn't mean you force them to talk. But by being present and open, people will talk to you. And that's what we need to do. Do tell them that you're going to get them the help they need. Do tell them that there are other options for them other than this option. And if concerned, we want to remove access to lethal means. One of the most powerful things we can do if somebody has access to lethal means, particularly a firearm, is to get that away from them as far as we can. Not everybody wants to give up their gun, especially in Vermont. We've got a pretty strong gun culture here. But if we can convince them that their best friend who they hunt with, maybe they should be holding onto the gun right now, people are usually going to agree with that, I have found. If we do it the right way, we do it in a sensitive way. Um, if somebody's thinking about overdosing on their pills, we might lock their pills up. We don't want to take people's control over them. We want to always do this as much as we can in a collaborative way, because that maintains the relationship and, and, and it helps people feel connected again to life. So we always want to do this collaboratively as possible. But if somebody has access to lethal means, the most important thing is to remove uh, access if we can. I want to plug a local group, Alternatives to Suicide. Uh, this occurs every Thursday, 1 to 2.30 at the Fletcher Free Library. It's run by Pathways to Housing. I'll read from the caption here. It's a safe place where the subject of suicide can be discussed freely, freely without fear of judgment or stigma. It is facilitated by individuals who have experienced suicidal thoughts or feelings themselves. So this is an open group where talking about 
not only suicide, but other things that are going on in one's life. Um, uh, this is what, what they do. Um, I actually did the alternatives to suicide training. It was a wonderful training um, and really uh, helped generate a feeling of connection, which is, is super important when people are feeling suicidal. So I would recommend that. Uh, some resources for suicide. Uh, here are a couple of webs uh, three websites that um, have information about suicide and um, um, prevention of suicide. Here are some suicide hotline numbers, the National Hopeline Network, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the GLBT National Hotline, the National Youth Talk Line, and that military veterans have their own hotline uh, that they can call uh, if feeling suicidal. If suicide appears imminent, if you're with somebody and you, you think this is going to happen imminently, um, you want to call somebody to get some help. Locally, every county in Vermont has their own crisis service. In Chittenden County, it's 488-6400. That's the Howard Center crisis line. You can call there. If you feel like you can't wait to get that call and wait until you're talking to somebody and talk it through, you can go to any emergency room for an evaluation by the crisis service <clears throat> or dial 911 if you think somebody has a gun, they're going to use it, call 911 if you need professional assistance. And that is it. If I do on time. Thank you. Good along on time. So the question is made that we do need to use the Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned that um, you may encounter a person who uh, has uh, uh, signs of depression plus uh, a substance abuse, and you try to treat both. Yes. Uh, does one therapist try to do that, or how is that managed? Great question. Yeah, so interestingly, we still have a dual licensing system where people are licensed as substance use clinicians or mental health clinicians, um, and many training programs focus on one or the other. The move is toward treatment of co-occurring conditions together. Uh, at Howard Center, for example, all of our, our therapists are duly licensed and can treat both. So we do want to address both. Uh, something to ask a therapist um, who you may be planning on seeing um, is whether they can treat both together, if both of those are issues for, for, for you or for someone you love. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, just a quick question about the one thing that you said was the, I think it was specific to the SSRIs about the chemical imbalance theory yes. being, was that just to the SSRIs or was that pretty much medication? Because you spent a fair amount of time then talking about medications. Right. So they're out there, but we don't, these do not work by correcting, as far as we know, don't work by correcting some underlying chemical imbalance. They work. I showed you the effect sizes. Right. They're large. How they work, we don't have any idea. Okay. And then I had a, another question, which yes. was um, long-term studies that differ, to look at the how effective CBT is versus IBT versus EIEIO. Yeah. Um, is there, over the long term, is there a, you know, does, do those therapies have differences between them? I would say the most important thing about the differences are you as an individual and what you're looking for. If you're somebody who is uh, very engaged by the idea of changing your thoughts and behaviors, kind of a very rationalist kind of approach is helpful, go with that. If you're somebody who has a lot of interpersonal issues in your life and you want to focus on that, do that. If you're someone who's interested in unconscious drives and defenses, the kind of the Freudian framework, do that. I really think it's more about you than it is about the technique, and the studies bear that out. The studies show that technique counts for about 1% of effectiveness of any uh, therapy. So I, as a resident, as a medical student, I was very hung up on that and trying to find the right one, which one I get trained in. And I found that just doing the work, it didn't, it didn't matter at all. And then, fortunately, I found studies that showed that what I was doing was the right thing to do. So that's always nice. Confirmation bias is a wonderful thing. Um, 
we didn't talk about genetics at all, and I just wondered if you could briefly mention right. if you think um, suicide or depression is at all genetic or could run in families. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, it's one of the slides I took out because I was running over time. Um, so yeah, so from, from the evidence that we have, genetics is roughly 40 to 50 percent uh, as, far, as far as the uh, what leads to eventual development of depression, genetics are about 40 to 50 percent of that. And the rest uh, tends to be, is environment. Um, of course, we can't you know, change our genetics, so you know, people are looking at different ways to modify environment to decrease risk of development of depression. But uh, yes, there is a, definitely a genetic component, both suicidality and depression. I have uh, two questions. One's very specific and one's very broad. Okay. The very specific question is you showed me a new term today, which is jitteriness. Yes. I didn't know that was a medical term, so thank you. I don't you. know if it is, but. Um, so could you, yeah, I liked it. Could you differentiate di uh, jitteriness versus manic? Yes. Yeah. Good question. So mania is um, a pretty uh, well-defined uh, state defined as um, occurring anywhere from at least four days for hypomania or seven days for a manic episode in which there's a marked change in, uh, in one's behavior, one's thinking, one's feelings from baseline. So mania, I got bipolar disorder, plenty of studies verify this, uh, the, the rates of diagnosis have gone up something like 300% in the last 15 years, 20 years. More so in kids. I think it was like 3,000% in kids. Big problem. Because it's, it, it, it's misdiagnosis. Um, but I, I have seen people, uh, psychiatrists, mis, misdiagnosed, according to the manual that we use, that's kind of like our guideline. But it's thrown around a lot. And, and this term mania, or I'm feeling manic, has been thrown around a lot. But it really means something specific um, when we use it clinically. And so these are episodes, again, at least four to seven days, not where I have people who are saying, like, I have five minutes of mania yesterday, and I had 15 minutes of mania before. That's not what we mean when we say mania. But it involves pressured speech, markedly elevated mood, usually severe irritability, uh, not sleeping, literally not sleeping, maybe or an hour of sleep a day, marked increase in activity, physical activity. Uh, Behaviors that will get you in big trouble, things like uh, driving your car like 100 miles an hour on the interstate, spending thousands of dollars you don't have, engaging in sexual behavior with random strangers, things like this. So one tends to be pretty disinhibited um, when one is manic. And when mania is over, you come out of this episode and either go into a depressive episode or what we call euthymia, it's another fancy term, meaning you ain't depressed, you ain't manic, you're kind of right in the middle. Um, jitteriness would be um, a feeling of like drinking too much coffee. It's a good way, you know, the way I experience too much caffeine. So you feel inside kind of shaky, you might even have a little bit of a tremor. That's what jitteriness is. So very different. Um, one can experience mood ups and downs, what we call mood lability. That's another fancy term, meaning you might, you're, you might be happy one second, sad. Uh, Could you say it later. again? Mood? Mood lability. Lability? Lability. This is helpful. To, this term is helpful because I think it captures a lot of what many people experience when they're not experiencing mania, but they're experiencing something else involving mood and abrupt changes. It can be associated with certain diagnosable things like ADHD, PTSD, certain anxiety conditions can be uh, involved, mood lability. Um, bipolar usually is not. I mean, people, when people are manic, they can have up and down, they can be crying one second and then really angry one second. You can see that, but it's only in the turn, usually in their, the context of their mood episode. Okay. Yeah. That's very helpful. Okay. Um, this is going to make me sound very smart later when I tell my wife all this, so <laughs> thank you. Mood liability, honey. Liability. It's a term that I know. Um, my other question is very broad. Joseph, you go by Joseph? Yeah, Joe. Um, Joe. Uh, I've talked about this before with people, and I don't know if you can answer this, but could, are you able to estimate in any way how many Vermonters struggle with seasonal depression? I can estimate based on, on evident, national um, 
evidence, and it's about 5% of Americans generally su suffer seasonal depression at a latitude similar to Vermont's latitude, up to 10%. I just gave this talk to residents on Tuesday, so I'm familiar with that data that we need to talk about that. So 10%? So about 10%. Okay. Now you can have, that's the full-blown major depression. You can have seasonal changes at a much higher percentage. And I, everybody I talk to, you know, by, especially by April, I mean, April's the worst month to, to be a psychiatrist because by then everybody's had an alat. Tax the season last, too, look out. What's that? Tax season also. Tax season too doesn't help. But the weather, by that time, everybody is, is really hurting and, um, and from the weather. And it, by May and June, nobody's showing up in my office anymore. Literally, the no-show rates just skyrocket. I get caught up on paperwork from the winter and spring. But it's amazing how many, almost everyone, I'd say, is ubiquitous in April if you talk to people. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. It's pleasure. helpful. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Sure. The first is regarding this alternative suicide group. Yes. Yes. Would this be an appropriate group for them, or is there a breakdown of this group where they would be only with peers suffering from the same issues? That's my first question. Yeah. My second question is, do you find that anxiety and depressive disorders are related in any way? Yeah. And um, because that's been my experience. Yep. All right, so the alternatives to the suicide group, what I would recommend is calling um, the wellness co-op. You can find those, you know, type wellness co-op, Burlington, online, and you can, you can ask them that specific question. I'm not sure demographically if, if they're comfortable working with adolescents, so it's certainly worth asking them, and then they may be able to, I'm not aware of resources for adolescents in that regard. If, if they're not able to, um, calling Howard Center's uh, uh, outpatient department and asking about that. Again, I don't typically work with adolescents, but th they may be able to, to, to help with that as well, helping you find a resource for that. With regard to depression and anxiety, I would say all of our psychiatric conditions are made up. They're not real things. There are ways that we try to make sense out of like this really varied human experience. So when we say you have depression with generalized anxiety disorder, well, no, you don't. I mean, you have your experience, and we're just trying to make something that makes sense to us so that we can help you with that. I really think diagnosis really is all for our purpose and not, not a label that really has a lot of meaning beyond that. So um, we know that anxiety symptoms are very high in people with depression. And we know that, for example, certain anxiety problems, like you know, people have a trauma history with, that might be criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, have very high rates of depression. But I don't say... If somebody has a severe trauma, like they've gone to Iraq and they experience trauma and they come back and they're having what looks like full-blown classic PTSD, that you also have depress major depressive disorder because you also meet criteria for that. I find that if I, first of all, people don't like that. People don't like, it makes people feel broken or stigmatized having all these different labels pl placed on them. So I think that is counterproductive. But it also isn't even true. It's, I think this one experience created this set of problems for you, includes mood symptoms and anxiety symptoms. Let's go ahead and focus on what caused this and, and help you with that, and then everything tends to get better. It's my general view of that. That's just my personal view. But yes, you know, they do go together. And your question about treatment with medications is, yes, we have to be, you know, we call these things antidepressants, but we use them for all sorts of issues. I don't think they're antidepressants. I think um, there's a, uh, my supervisor, Sandy Steingart, is, is very big on this, and she's converted me to this idea that um, there's something called the, the disease-centered view of mental health and the drug-centered view of mental health. The, excuse me? I thought somebody said something. Disease versus drug-centered. So disease-centered would be like there's major depression and there's other treatments. There is general anxiety disorder and these are treatments. The drug-centered view would be that drugs have effects. And we can use those effects to our benefit, hopefully. So antidepressants may help anxiety for some people but may generate anxiety symptoms for other people. And so we got to be very careful about that and cognizant of that and minimize the chance that that happens. Uh, sedatives like benzodiazepines decrease anxiety. It's one thing they can do, but they also cause depression, sedation, 
dementia now we're finding that benzodiazepines cause dementia. Um, so we got to look at the effects, and not get hung up on what we consider to be the therapeutic effects. That's my answer to that. Thank you. All right. Thanks. It, 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 yes, it's on. Um, when you were talking about TCA risks, you mentioned um, Benadryl. Benadryl is uh, another anticholinergic medication. It's not a tricyclic antidepressant, but it also has anticholinergic effects like most tricyclic antidepressants do. Okay, so, and you, that had a relationship with dementia if you use it long term? Yes, like, it does. I see so many older people who, who use it as a, a, their normal sleep aid. Terrible idea. And, and as you said, they bump it up. And bump it up is an even worse idea. Eventually, most anticholinergic medications, if you get too high, actually worsen your sleep because they interrupt brain function. And so you don't want to do that. The lower doses are actually more sedating because you get more of the antihistamine effects. And most is that antihistamines, the only you want to stay at lower doses of those medicines to avoid that. Is that the only medication that anything does over this? The, anything over the counter is going to be an antihistamine with potential anticholinergic effects. Okay, thanks. So... This is getting into another interest in my mind. Maybe this will be in a future talk because I really am fascinated by sleep and really believe sleep medications are generally terrible and not effective. And the best treatment for sleep, again, is psychotherapy. Surprise, surprise. Cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia specifically. So if somebody is having problems um, with sleep, we, we want to do more of those things, correct their behaviors and our thoughts around sleep rather than popping a pill, which... There's no evidence that any of these medications are very effective, spe especially long-term. Most studies on sleep meds are go like four weeks. Only a couple have been looked at at six months. I've answered all your questions. <laughs> Take that as a... Do we have time for one more, Denise? I have a hand up there. Yeah, I think that's fine. Oh, you can double div. Somebody else has a question? Oh, okay. And then here. Hello. Um, Hi. I'm, I'm working with people who are less than depressed, it looks like. Okay. But these people are sad. They're lonely. Yeah. And they're, in the, and they're elderly. They're yeah. by themselves um, isolated. And they're, some of them have mental disabilities. Yeah. So what can the layman do, like myself or people who aren't really associated with by relationship or, you know, like a family member or something, but just people who work with them. What, what can we do for these kind of people who are just kind of like, just they are sad and all the time? Great question. Um, so going back to that, that early slide that I showed, the idea that for people who are sad because their needs aren't being met is to really address with them what those are. What needs... Would, are, are being, not being met for you, which after identifying those, how do we get those needs met? Now, I can tell you it's a, it's, it's a tremendous challenge. Our society is not geared towards supporting healthy human functioning, I don't think. Um, we're all socially isolated. We're all way more focused on independence than is healthy for us. Um, I think as we get older, people can, tend to get more isolated and alone. And not, as human beings who are not designed for this way of living, that you're always going to be sad. And so what, what I'm hearing most and what you're saying in my experience too is that connection is lacking. Social connection is lacking. Yeah. And how can we increase social connection? There are some resources out there, senior centers, um, you know, other programs. They're not for every person. I have a lot of people I work with where it just doesn't work for them. And then we get into a very stuck place because our society is just so focused on independence. So I don't have a good answer for you there because I, I struggle with it every day. Working with people, I might get the worst of depression helped. We might do some psychotherapy, which helps. And then they're like, well, I'm just lonely. I just don't have any friends or connections. And who can feel happy? I couldn't. So I think we're struggling with that as a society. You know, there's a, there's a survey they do every few years. I've heard these results where they ask people how many confidants you have. And for the first time ever, this was like a year or two ago, the majority had none in our society. And I think about 20-something, 25% had one. 
and you know only more you know less than 25 percent had more than that so we're, we're a very lonely society one last question Thank you. One of the last slides dealt with a suicide support group. Yes. Do you um, make any uh, use, encouragement of other support groups, such as the anonymous groups, in, in dealing with any substance abuse disorders? Yes. Yes. And, and for some people, those are very helpful. For other people, they're not. There, you know, there around substance use there are many good local resources. There's you know many AA groups. Turning Point is a wonderful. Uh, place where people get support. The Wellness Co-op, which runs the, the suicide uh, prevention group, um, ha is a wonderful resource for social connection for people. Um, there's a, for people who are not into the AA model, there is the um, Smart Recovery Group uh, in the UU Church on Sundays, which is a more kind of behavioral self-help model for people who aren't into the higher power thing. So there are good resources locally. Yeah. Thank you. Can I say one thing Sure. Um, my name is Sue, and I've been diagnosed with depression a number of times. And this most recent time, I was diagnosed with major depression and was helped through the Seneca Center at the hospital. And um, I think that there are some people here who are here because this is their work. And I suspect there's also some people here because they're, they think they're going through a depression, or they are, or they have a loved one. So I would like to just encourage them to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. And not just, I'm depressed, I'm sad. It's, no, I'm going through a depression. I know I am. Yeah. Doctor, spouse, child, whatever. So Thank just you. talk about it, even if it's just that one sentence, I'm depressed. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Thank you very much, everybody. If, if people could um, complete the feedback forms, that would be great. There's a, a jar right here.